Good morning. It's wonderful to see you today. Everybody doing good? Yeah. Woo, we have had a fun week here at Blackwater UMC. Amen? Yeah. It has been incredible. We had 600 people in the, in, in the two hours that we did Journey to Bethlehem last night. And so we had a lot of visitors. You can give the Lord some praise for that. That's amazing. We nearly opened the balcony at our Christmas cantata uh, on Sunday evening, and we did open the balcony for our PDO event <laughs> because it was so packed in here. So this church has been done great. I just want to thank everybody who has been involved with making Christmas here so special, and we're going to continue that this morning. Would you please stand as we sing our opening hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. the Duff family to come and do our Advent reading. Isaiah told the king of his time that the Lord himself would give a sign, look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. God wants us to know God is there even when we aren't sure ourselves. God wants us to experience God's presence even when we think we can handle life on our own. God, send us, God sends us signs of God's presence with us. All we need to do is keep our eyes open and look around us. Look, the virgin shall conceive a son and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from the sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne the son, and he named him Jesus. We light these candles, the candles of joyous hope, of proclaimed peace, of deep everlasting joy, and today the presence that speaks of love. 
as a sign that no matter our circumstance, we know we are not alone. Would y'all join me to pray? Holy God, thank you for the gift of love from heaven, Jesus Christ. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Amen. Please join me in the Apostles' Creed. It'll be on the screen or in your hymnal at 881. Louder? Hmm? Oh, please stand. <laughs> I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Hence he should come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. of welcoming this morning. morning. Happy Sunday! All right, if you will, go ahead and make your way to your seats. I would appreciate it. Have a seat for just a minute. We're going to talk about some of the ways that we can do life together. Of course, tonight is our finale for our Journey to Bethlehem experience, and that's going to be from 6 to 8. So if you have friends, our loved ones, our neighbors that you can invite, we would love to have them here. We had such a, a tremendous night last night, so let's finish strong with that. Also want to remind you that it is time. We are going to be having our Christmas Eve services on Saturday evening. That'll be 5 o'clock here in the sanctuary. There's a pajama family service over in the table at 7, and so that's wonderful. If you have kids, you'll know that it's always great to have them in pajamas because you can take them straight home and put them to bed, so um, that's wonderful. And so we also have Christmas Day service. That's going to be one combined service at 11 in the fellowship hall, and uh, it's going to be a great time. We're, we have a wonderful uh, Christmas uh, morning service. We thought we'd let you sleep in a little bit that day. Um, that'll be a church-wide service, and I am going to do a blessing of the toys in that service. So if you have grandkids or kids and you want to bring them, tell them to bring their favorite toy and we'll bless that in the service. Um, also, that service includes a continental uh, brunch. Uh, there is a youth um, uh, camps are, are starting over in the PDO, the children's camps. Those are for ages three to six years old, and uh, that runs the week before and after Christmas and also the week of New Year's. And so that's a wonderful uh, thing for our children uh, to be doing uh, this time of year. So um, I appreciate all of the things that we have. There are gumbo cells, too, at the end of service today. I'll try to remind you during the benediction so you don't forget. My wife and I had the gumbo. 
delicious. It's amazing. We all approve. So that's wonderful. At this time, I'd like to ask those who are going to prepare to receive our offering this morning uh, to get ready for that. And as they do, um, I just want to remind you that we offer our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness to the Lord. We offer five things in our offering time. I would ask that you would have the Holy Spirit seek your heart for somebody to bring them to mind to you to pray for would ask that you be thinking about what God is doing in your lives and that you would be willing to share that with somebody else so that we are good news for the world uh, today. Thank you. Uh, Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for the gifts that we are about to receive. We ask, Lord, that you would multiply them so that this earth may know you as king. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. morning. Let's bow our heads as we go to the Lord in corporate prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for that small baby that came over 2,000 years ago that paid the debt for all of us. We can never say thank you enough for that gift. May that memory live within us so that we forgive those around us, that we show the the joy that it is to have you as our Savior so that the world feels invited and those who don't understand or know the opportunity to get to know you, may we be a welcoming place that brings them in. May we be the face that they see that 
they see love in. May we be the arms they feel comfort in. May we be the ears that listen. And we, may we be the hearts that have compassion. So guide us as we think of that baby and all the ways that we live our lives so that as we sing with joy in our hearts for that baby, that we sing for joy for the world that surrounds us and all that you give us opportunity to be involved in. We ask now that we join together in the prayer that you taught the disciples to pray when we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. The scripture I'm reading today is found in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be pregnant from the Holy Spirit. Her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to divorce her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall become pregnant and give birth to a son, 
and they shall call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had given birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Recently, I was told about, uh, about a boy here in southern Louisiana, and he had come home one very hot afternoon, and he was really, really, really looking forward to taking a swim in the water behind his house. This was the usual way that he saved himself from our extreme heat in the summer months. He would go and cool himself off. When he got home, he was so anxious to get in that water that he didn't even bother to uh, go inside and change clothes. He just started racing for the water and stripped his shirt off and his shoes and his socks, and, and along he went. Now, his mother had spotted him diving off of their dock, and so she followed him down there to go check on him. And as she watched him swim out into the middle of the water, she caught sight of a little ripple in the shore on the opposite side, and she realized that there was an alligator who was moving towards her son. And she began to scream out to warn him of what was happening, and and she realized all the danger that he was in, and, and so did he, and so he began to race to swimming towards the dock, this alligator. And just as his mother reached for him to pull him out, so did the alligator reach for him. And they ended up in a tug-of-war made of nightmares. It wasn't long before the water was quickly filled with blood. Now, there was a farmer who just happened praise be to God, to be working out in his fields. And he heard the mother's screaming and her cries for help. And so he ran over to the dock to help her. And luckily when he did, he had his gun with him and he was able to take a couple of shots at the alligator. And then, of course, he hurried about helping the mother get some help for the son and get an ambulance out to the scene. And so the boy survived, and it made news all over town. And several weeks later, when he was released from the hospital, there was a news conference that was being held where he talked to some local reporters. And one of the reporters asked the boy if, if he could see where the alligator had bitten him. And with the pride of a typical young boy, he rolled up his uh, you know, pant leg, and, and he showed off his healing wounds, and the reporter was like all in awe. And then the boy said one interesting thing. He said, but there's more. And so he rolled up his sleeves, and he showed the reporter the scars from fingernails up and down his arms. And he said, look, I have these scars on my arms too, he said. I got them because my mom was determined not to let me go. She saved my life. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. 
We thank you for your help and your rescue. In Christ's name, we pray. Amen. Have we ever needed a Savior? Well, it may depend on who you ask. Maybe a soldier on either side of the war on the battlefield in Ukraine might feel more passionately about that today than others. Maybe someone experiencing homelessness or poverty, sleeping out under one of our bridges on a cold night, might feel more inclined for help from a Savior. But do you need a Savior? Let's talk about Christmas while we're asking questions. What comes to mind when we think about Christmas? We all have some preconceived notions some expectations, our ideas of what a perfect Christmas looks like. Some of us value very elaborate preparations. And I know that some of us love good old Hallmark at this time of year. Amen. You know, the people of Israel, they knew that they needed a Savior. And they had waited a very long time, as the choir just sang about in their anthem, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. That was written by Charles Wesley, John Wesley's brother, the founder of Methodism. His brother wrote that beautiful song. And I told the choir this morning, boy, he really captured Israel's longing for a Savior. You see, they were held captive. They were taxed to smithereens. Now, Bert Neal was... Caesar Augustus last night, what a great cast that was. <laughs> I told them, you need to stop taxing people, that's not nice. But see, the Israelites, they were overrun by Rome. It was a real mess. God had delivered them before, though, through some very similar circumstances in Egypt. And now here they were again. It was as if history were repeating itself. You know, the first Christmas doesn't open with flawless and elaborate seasonal preparations sponsored by Hallmark, does it? In fact, what we find instead is that the real nativity is full of both wonder and scandal. The preceding verses leading up to what was read this morning, take us through the genealogy of the house of David. And they seek to show us that Jesus is a descendant out of the Davidic bloodline. Yet, when we get to Joseph's name in this genealogy, we get a very awkward statement that is not in the pattern of the rest of the names on that list. It simply says, and I quote, Joseph was the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born. Now, this passage presents an immediate challenge about Jesus' biological parents, doesn't it? And a really significant one. We don't typically talk a lot about Joseph, but he was faithful. He was a Jewish man, and he was a descendant of David. But make no mistake, when he learned that Mary was found to be pregnant with a child from the Holy Spirit, his responses would have been ingrained in him through his faith. An ancient engagement in his faith was essentially marriage awaiting the consummation. It was an already done deal, you see. And now he must divorce his unfaithful wife. It would have been a given. This pregnancy by the Holy Spirit, that was unheard of. <laughs> and it was a violation of social norms and ethics. As a Jewish man at that time, there would be no let's uh, forgive this and forget it, right? But watch what God did. God sent the angel, a messenger, 
to Joseph in a dream and actually underscored the genealogy again when the angel refers to Joseph as the son of David. So we know that there's something important in the works here. And the angel said, essentially, I know this isn't what you expected, but it is going to be okay because God is going to do amazing things despite your situation. And then the angel, the messenger of God, told Joseph that he was to remain with Mary and then in just a few words revealed the boiled down meaning and purpose of perhaps Joseph's whole life, you shall name him Jesus. And Joseph's obedience to those few words upended religious convention and norms. And so began the fulfillment of the messianic prophecy. Joseph legally adopted Jesus into the Davidic bloodline, and that, my friends, is a big deal. Because Joseph put his name on Jesus, and Jesus was about to return the favor in a mind-bending and mysterious way. At no point was Joseph asking for any trouble or trying to be politically rebellious here. He wasn't trying to be a goody two-shoes and blow himself up as a Jewish descendant of the house of David. On the contrary, he was going to quietly not shame Mary, even though she should not be pregnant. But his decision to remain faithful to Mary violated social expectations and norms when God intervened in unexpected ways. See, this same kind of thing, it, it happens to you and to me. Remember when I asked you about whether you needed a Savior? When we really think about it, haven't we all been bitten by life's big alligator? Aren't we all exiled in one way or another? Especially when we start asking the big and the tough questions, questions like, am I truly happy? Especially when we ask the big questions like, what about my life is unfulfilling? Or what is it going to take for me to be happy and finally peaceful? Now, some of you might be like, I'm fine and dandy. Cool. Then do you know why you were created? What's your purpose for being right here, right now? What happens next? I've seen people who seem to have it all one day. But then they make a choice to end it all. Just this week, a young man by the name of Twitch, a very, very talented dancer, who was also the DJ on the Ellen DeGeneres show, <laughs> took his own life. What happens next? What is life all about? As your pastor, I think these questions are important for us because I believe that they help us to begin to understand why we need a Savior. Because we're all in exile in one way or another. We've all been bitten and pulled. Can you relate? Because... Because you don't just have things happen to you in this life and not feel a little like Joseph. Really not wanting any trouble. Really wanting to just kind of handle things quietly without a big fuss. Not a bunch of onlookers. Just trying to be content to live within the social constructs of what's normal 
of what's conventional, trying to live up to expectations of how others tell us how our life and circumstances should be so that we know when we are a mess and when we're not a mess. But is that really helpful? Is that really a rescue from God? Don't you see the right questions? They lead us to risky business and unconventional places, uncomfortable places where things might actually change. And the truth is that sin is a choice that we make to minister to ourselves rather than to rely on a Savior to minister to us. Sin is a choice to reject Emmanuel, to reject God with us. It is to isolate ourselves, to internalize our troubles, and to handle it all quiet. Unfortunately, our ways lead to blood in the water and certain death. But thankfully... Christ's way, well, that leads to eternal life. When we freely choose to follow Jesus, we are incorporated into the Messiah's people. Like Joseph did when he put his name on Jesus, Jesus did for us. You see, in the waters of your baptism, your last name was changed. Your last name became Christian. Many Christ's. When you went down in those waters, your name was no longer Phelps or Denham or Merrill or Ford or anything else. You came up and your name was Christian. You were adopted into Jesus' bloodline. And now you're Jesus' mini-me, aren't you? And why would God be trying to get that through our heads this Advent? Why would God come to you in the year 2022 and attempt to use me and this word to help upset the comfort of our social expectations and social norms? Because you can probably hear God saying some of the same things to you that the messenger said to Joseph in this text. I know it isn't what you expected. I know life's been a little different. It's not a hallmark life. Get it. It's imperfect, and it's probably not extravagantly dressed to the nines. But there is no perfect Christmas, and that's the point. But it's okay, because God is still going to do amazing things despite your situation. (laughs) What if God is trying to tell you That unexpected things outside of convention and norms and the way that everyone else tries to tell you that it should be is exactly the sign that God is at work. (laughs) And it may not be perfect and it may not be sponsored by Hallmark, but it is the new thing that God is doing and it is going to be awesome because God is with you. You know, Joseph, he had to trust some really strange news. That his child was from the Holy Spirit. That his child was already named. That his child would save all these people from their sins. Maybe, just maybe, Joseph can be used today to inspire us to trust God. What do you think? Could this really be? What it means to be saved by a baby in a manger? Is the love that came down from Christmas, the long-expected Jesus, the child of wonder, the child of Israel, the Lord of us all, everybody? You see, Joseph had no idea that Jesus, that his little baby, would take this epic journey from Bethlehem To Jerusalem. He had no idea what was coming. From the manger, to the temple, to the cross, 
to the tomb, to the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and now is coming fresh in our hearts this morning and in our Christmas Eve candlelight service this coming Saturday and at our Christmas Day morning service. And that one day this child is coming back to reign in peace forever in the kingdom of God. If Joseph had known every detail, if he had known it all, his head would have exploded. It would have. And you know what? The same is true for us. We can't handle the truth. (laughs) If we knew every detail, our heads would explode. There's a lot to be said for just some simple trust once you believe. The fact is that us not trusting Jesus, our Savior, reflects the fear that we have from failing over and over and over again to save ourselves. That's the truth. But church, Jesus is different. He is He's like that mother on the dock who saved her son by holding on. He's God's perfect love who came to save us and to set us free. (laughs) Yes, we may have scars from where he held on to us. Scars because no amount of chemicals or no amount of drugs or no amount of relationships or sex or money or winning or being right or being perfect is going to save us. They all have a big bite. And at the end of the day, Hallmark has no real power. But starting right now, you see, we can all get together and agree to trust and to hold on to Jesus who's holding on tight to us. To come in and fill our emptiness. To remove the void in our hearts by standing in the gap and setting our hearts on fire. Warming them with his love. (laughs) Mm. I believe with all my heart that Jesus is staging a divine intervention of love this morning. For us today. Why? Because he cares about us so much. Jesus' wisdom and love is attempting to shape our next actions and our next responses. He came to Joseph in a dream, and Joseph showed profound trust. Can we trust in Jesus' dream for us today? Doesn't mean you won't have questions. Joseph had questions too. What should I do about Mary? What does the law demand of me? What is my own heart saying? We do have questions, but the important question is, are we ready to hear what Jesus is saying when he answers them? God came to Joseph to show him not to use his humility to isolate himself, not to try to handle his troubles on his own quietly. Not to try and be his own savior. God knew Joseph couldn't save himself. And God knows we can't either. Instead, God came to Joseph to tell him to stay the course with Mary. Remain by her side. Are there going to be scars from holding on? Yes. Does it go against convention and against norms? Yes. But to quietly submit himself to his wife's God-given calling. Now that was certainly an upside-down thought for a Jewish man of those times. Nothing conventional or normal about that. And God has told us, It is not about us. God has us covered through the baby in the manger. God told us it is also about loving others. God came and told Joseph to play the supporting role because his pregnant wife and adopted son were about to play a starring role in a messy, scandalous first Christmas movie that was certainly wondrous, but definitely no Hallmark holiday moment. I mean, 
the Jewish man was an extra. There were all these unclean shepherds. There were foreigners and extraterrestrial beings there worshiping a baby. And not just any baby, but an adopted baby with three parents. Now, if that were a Facebook relationship status, it would be, it's complicated. (laughs) Then there were animals and hay and all the things that come with animals and hay. Hallmark would cringe. They would never dream of making a movie about that setting or with that cast. Never. But as Christians... Children adopted as the Messiah's own people, we know the truth. Friends, it is time for us to prepare to receive our salvation fresh again and one that is in deep relationship with our proper humility. It is time for us to lay down our arrogant thoughts that we can somehow improve upon God's plan And what that was from the very beginning, it's time for us to stop pronouncing who we think is saved and how they are saved and who is not and why they are not because we're not saviors. We're just hallmark, heaping on expectation and mopping up the messiness and true beauty of God's plan. But Jesus Christ... Well, he's God with us. (laughs) It is time for us to stop taking matters into our own hands and failing to save ourselves time after time, thus undermining our trust in any Savior at all. It is time for us to show proper humility, to trust in God's big dream for us, to let Jesus put his name on us and deliver us Because he is the Savior, and because we are not. We may have some scars. Yes, we may. But that's because he's holding on to us so tight in a tug-of-war with the gators of this world. And Jesus, well, he's done it so amazingly, so divinely. What if... Instead of being known as know-it-alls with exploding heads, we simply take the proper, humble, supporting role of trusting and following, taking on Christ's name, and extending his hope and his peace and his joy and his love and pointing to his rescue. I don't know about you, But I would rather be an extra, a Joseph, in Jesus' messy story and on the receiving end of his love and salvation than to star in my own Hallmark show about my proven inability to save myself, always ending in bloody waters and death. Jesus' true story for us never ends. It is real, eternal life, eternal hope, never-ending peace, unending joy, and unfailing love. I'll take God's version of Christmas over hallmarks any day. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. It never returns void. It works in us. It stirs in us. You are working in us. You are stirring in us. You are changing us. You are guiding our responses. You are calling us to our next actions. May we spend this moment of discipleship sitting under the correction and guidance of your Holy Spirit and under the peace of the Prince of Peace. May your joy be ours despite our circumstances. Come, 
thou long expected Jesus. In Christ's name, amen. This moment is for you. This moment is a moment of discipleship. It's it's whatever the Holy Spirit's moving in your hearts to do. Maybe it's to join the church. Maybe it's to pray for somebody. Maybe it is to come forward and, and to remember your baptism here at the font. Maybe, maybe it's to something else. But this is your time. This is your time to respond to Jesus. Would you please stand as we sing our invitation to discipleship? People of God, receive this benediction. Go with the love of Christ, burning warmly in your hearts. Go and share the light of Christ and his reign with others so that they may truly know him as king. For there is only one Savior. Go with the peace of Christ and may the peace of Christ go in you. Amen.